Um, so the last time uh, we uh, we looked at unitary equivalence. So A and B are unitarily equivalent if B is equal to U Hermitian A U, where U is a unitary matrix. Uh, and we also looked at the notion of Euclidean isometry. We finally showed one small result which said that uh, A and B, uh, if A and B are unitarily equivalent, then the Frobenius norm square of the two matrices, which is the sum of the squares of all the elements of the matrix, will be equal. Okay, so today we will discuss uh, some concluding observations about unitary equivalence, and then we will cover this uh, Schur's unitary triangularization theorem. Okay, so a couple of remarks. One is that um, uh, unitary equivalence, okay, two matrices are unitarily equivalent. It means that they are similar because for a unitary matrix, U Hermitian equals U inverse. So they satisfy the definition of similarity, but the converse is not necessarily true. So two similar matrices need not be unitarily equivalent. Okay, that also means that unitary equivalence partitions uh, the complex n cross n uh, matrix space into a finer equivalence class compared to similarity uh, similarity based equivalence. So within each similarity based equivalence, there could be many matrices that are unitarily equivalent to each other, but many subclasses which are not unitarily equivalent to each other. But any pair of matrices that are unitarily equivalent are also similar, so they belong to the same similarity class. Okay, and um, <clears throat> we, we, we observed that the similarity transform is essentially, uh, it corresponds to a change of basis. That is, if you have a linear transform and you change the basis, then you ask what is the new linear transform according to the new basis, that is given by the similarity transform. However, the unitary equivalence is also a change of basis, but a special one. It's a change of basis from one orthonormal basis to another. Okay, so um, to continue, um, uh, oftentimes uh, we like unitary equivalents because they are simpler to compute. So, uh, I mean, simpler to compute than similarity. So for example, there is no matrix inversion involved. It's U Hermitian AU. So, um, and it's also numerically more stable because these unitary matrices are well conditioned. And so numerically computing a similarity transform is more stable than computing a similarity transform. Okay, now I'll give you two examples of important uh, unitary matrices that show up in many applications. So the first is called plane rotations. Um, so we write u of theta i j is this matrix which has ones on the diagonal and somewhere in between it has a cos theta and then some more ones and then another cos theta then maybe some more ones and here it has a sine theta or maybe minus sine theta and sine theta here and then zeros everywhere else
So basically, this is the I throw. And this is the J throw. And this is the eighth column. And this is the Jth column. Okay, so the I throw and so it's basically the identity matrix except in the I and Jth column where the column I column J uh, sub matrix forms a two cross two matrix with uh, cos theta minus sin theta minus uh, sin theta and cos theta as its four elements. So this is called a plane rotation. Um, the second one is called the householder transform. It's named after the mathematician who came up with it, not uh, uh, not because it's uh, it has anything to do with householders. Um, <coughs> so let W be a vector in C to the n, which is non-zero. Then Q W is defined as I minus two W W Hermitian divided by W Hermitian W. Okay, so an exercise for you is to verify that these two are uh, indeed unitary matrices. So this is what I wanted to say about unitary matrices and unitary equivalence. Um, but we are going to use that immediately in this uh, next result, which we are going to discuss, which is Schur's unitary triangularization theorem. Yes. Well, sir, we understand the use of uh, plane rotation matrix, but what is the use of this uh, householder transform? I mean, can, can you tell some application? So it's useful, for example, in computing the QR decomposition of a matrix. Um, it's also useful uh, in. Um, uh, so. Um, one way to. Decompose a matrix. Uh, is to write the matrix as the product of a series of householder transforms and a diagonal or an upper triangular matrix followed by another series of householder transforms. So it's mainly used in uh, at least one of the uses is in matrix factorizations into simpler forms. Okay, so thank you. Sir. Yeah. So this uh, shows unitary triangularization theorem is a is a very important result in linear algebra. In fact, uh, what Horn and Johnson says uh, about this theorem is that it is perhaps the most fundamentally useful fact of elementary linear, linear algebra. So if there's one theorem that you want to take away from this course, uh, this could be one of them, okay? So essentially the theorem says that any complex N cross N matrix is unitarily equivalent to an upper triangular matrix, okay? And so um, it so while this kind of decomposition of uh, A and showing it to be unitarily equivalent to an upper triangular matrix uh, is far from unique, it still represents the simplest form that one can achieve using unitary equivalence. And of course, because the unitary uh, equivalence preserves all the eigenvalues, um, obviously, if you can find the uh, equivalent, unitarily equivalent upper triangular matrix, 
then the diagonal entries of that upper triangular matrix are the eigenvalues of this matrix. So the decomposition also reveals the eigenvalues of the matrix. So let's uh, let's formally write down what the theorem is. So given a n c to the n cross n with eigenvalues lambda 1 to lambda n there is a unitary matrix u such that u Hamitian a u is equal to t which we will write as its elements as t i j this matrix t this u Hamitian a u equal to t is upper triangular with diagonal elements lambda 1 through lambda n. Okay. Further, if a and all its eigenvalues real then you may be chosen to be real and orthogonal. OK, so this is the theorem. I'll just sort of wait for a few seconds for you to read it again because it's such an important theorem. So you can look at it for a few seconds. <coughs> so quick question, uh, if a matrix is, uh, if, the, if all the entries of a matrix are real valued, uh, isn't it uh, necessary that all its eigenvalues are real? No. Yeah, what is an example of a very simple, the simplest two cross two matrix you can think of, which has real valued entries, but complex valued eigenvalues? Sir, uh, I think cos theta, sin theta, minus sin theta, cos theta. So all the entries are real value. And uh, what are its eigenvalues? We have to actually find it, right? So let's do it just for the fun of it. So if I do determinant of lambda i minus this matrix equals 0, I'll get lambda minus cos theta, the whole square, minus and then it becomes plus sine squared theta equals zero. Check me, check and let me know if I make a mistake. So if I simplify this, this gives me 
lambda squared minus 2 lambda cos theta plus 1 equals 0 and its roots are lambda equals 2 cos theta plus or minus square root of 4 cos squared theta minus 4 divided by 2. Is that correct? So let me know if I make a mistake. So that is lambda equals cos theta plus or minus i times square root of 1 minus cos squared theta is sine squared theta. So correct. So basically its eigenvalues are complex even though the matrix are real, matrix is real valued. So you can't run away from complex numbers if you want to study matrices and its eigenvalue properties. Okay, so this is an aside. So now let's prove this theorem. So that's why we need to say if A and all its eigenvalues are real, then it is true that you can choose U to be a real orthogonal matrix. OK, so let um, x1 be a unit norm eigenvector of A. Associated with lambda 1. OK, now, uh, so this is a unit norm vector. What we'll do is we'll extend x1 to a basis. That is, you find other vectors that are linearly independent of x1, such that x1, y2, etc. up to y n form a basis of c to the n. Then we'll apply Gram Schmidt. This will give me a set of vectors which are all unit norm, which I'm going to call x1, say <coughs> Of course, the first vector is already unit norm. So when you apply Gram-Schmidt, that doesn't change the first vector, but it will change the second, third, all that. So we'll call it Z2 up to Zn, which are orthonormal vectors forming a basis of C to the N. So this is an orthonormal basis. Then what we'll do is uh, we'll let U1 be the matrix X1, Z2, Zn. Okay, so now um, if I, so we'll start with this matrix. Now, if I consider what happens to the first column of A U1, that's the same as U, um, X1 times A. The first column of U1 is X1. So the first column of this product A U1 will be X1 times A, which is equal to lambda 1 times X1. OK, and also if I did U1, Hermitian times X1, what I'll get is U1 is this matrix. It's an orthonormal matrix. So if I do U1 Hermitian X1, this is going to be a vector whose first element will be X1 Hermitian X1, which is equal to 1. The second element will be Z2 Hermitian X1, which is 0. The last element will be 
Zn Hermitian x1, which is also 0. So this is actually just the vector 1, 0, 0. So this means that if I do u1 Hermitian ax1, a u1, then I get the first column of this product is actually this lambda 1 times this column here. So that will just give me lambda 1, 0, 0. And over here in the first row, I'll get some, some entries. I actually don't care about them. And I'll call whatever I get down here as the matrix A1. OK, now lambda 1 is here. So what can I say about the eigenvalues of A1? The eigenvalues of A are lambda 1 to lambda n. And I found a unitary matrix U and computed U1, U1 Hermitian A U1. And this matrix has lambda 1 followed by zeros here. So it's a block upper triangular matrix with lambda 1 up here and an A1 matrix down here. And so what will be the eigenvalues of A1? Lambda 2 to lambda n. Exactly. The other eigenvalues will be the eigenvalues of A1. Now, what we'll do is the same idea exactly, but repeated with respect to A1. So let X2 in, now X2 will be in C to the N minus one. This A1 is of size N minus one cross N minus one. So let this be, um, Let x2 <coughs> n minus 1 be unit norm eigenvector of a1 associated with lambda 2. OK, then again, as before, we extend x2 to form a basis of c to the n minus 1. So the proof is constructive. Okay, so we show that you can construct a matrix satisfying U Hermitian AU is equal to T, where T is an upper triangular matrix with diagonal entries lambda 1 to lambda n. So we're just constructing this matrix. So this is X2 and say um, Y2 up to y n minus 1. So I need to find another n minus 2 vectors. There's one vector already. So these n minus 2 vectors together form a basis for c to the n minus 1. And then we'll apply Gram-Schmidt. And we'll get an orthonormal matrix which we'll call U2, which is equal to X2, Z2, Z, N minus 1. And this U2 is such that U2 Hermitian A1 U2 
will be equal to what? It will be exactly in this form here. So it will have lambda 2 here and zeros everywhere else in the first column and a matrix which we'll call A2 down here. And here it has something which we don't care about. And again, this matrix will have eigenvalues lambda 3 to, lam to lambda n and it's of size n minus 2 cross n minus 2. But ultimately we want to multiply with the matrix A, so it's not enough if we can find a U2 such that this happens. We need to find <coughs> a matrix that I can multiply with A. So let V2 be the matrix 1, 0, 0 and then zeros in the first row and U2 down here. Okay, then V2 is unitary. You can verify this by direct multiplication. V2 Hermitian V2 will give you the identity matrix. So if V2 is unitary, clearly, or rather remember maybe that U1 V2, the product of unitary matrices is also unitary. and u1 v2 Hermitian a u1 v2 will give us the matrix lambda 1 zeros and lambda 2 in the second row zeros and this can be something and here also you may have something out here, but you will have the matrix A2 here. Okay, so, so now we have lambda 1 and lambda 2 on the diagram. Yes. Uh, sir, could you explain V2 once more, please? V2 is just a matrix where I have padded um, 1, 0, 0, 0 on, on the left and then this the all zero ve uh, vector on this part on the right, uh, on the top. So it's now this matrix is now of size n cross n. Okay, okay. So we've just extended u2 to n cross n. Yes. So okay. basically on, on the side, on the left and top, you insert zeros, but on the top, left, you insert a 1. Okay, so basically now we see the pattern, so we continue this process. To get this matrix U, which is equal to U1, V2, up to Vn minus 1, which is unitary. And U Hermitian AV, AAU, is equal to T, which is in the desired form. Basically upper triangular with all the eigenvalues going on the diagonal. Now, the, for the last part of the theorem, if uh, A and its eigenvalues are real, then the eigenvectors can be chosen to be real. And all the above arguments can be applied with real arithmetic. So that, that, that verifies the last assertion. So if A 
and its eigenvalues are real all the above okay let me put it this way the eigenvector of a can be chosen to be real and all the above steps can be done with real arithmetic. So that's the proof. There's another version of this theorem for uh, considering strictly real uh, matrices. And uh, basically, as we've seen, strictly real matrices don't necessarily have real eigenvalues, but it turns out that um, if the I, so here's a statement. If, um, if a matrix is real valued, then its eigenvalues always occur in complex conjugate pairs. Why is that true? So can you please repeat? If a matrix is real valued, then the eigenvalues, even if they're complex valued, always occur in complex conjugate pairs. Sir, trace so, is real and the trace is sum of all eigenvalues. Okay. So if the sum of all eigenvalues is real, does that mean that the eigenvalues must occur as complex conjugate pairs? Yes, sir. Bec uh, then the sum of the conjugate pairs becomes real. If any no, one that, of them... That goes the other way, right? If I take complex conjugate numbers and add them up, I will get a real number. Yes, sir. But it doesn't mean that the only way to get real numbers is by adding complex conjugate pairs. Uh, sir, can we say that uh, the characteristic, the root of the characteristic polynomial is eigenvalue and the roots always occur in complex conjugate pairs? That is correct, but why is that true? Uh, sir, that I don't know. That's because the characteristic polynomials coefficients Okay, are some strange combinations of the entries of the matrix A, right? And if A is real valued, the coefficients of the characteristic polynomial are all real valued. Okay, so if I have an equation like, so again, this is an aside. If I have an equation like, um, say, A n lambda to the n plus a n minus 1 lambda to the n minus 1 plus dot 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 plus a naught equals 0. This is the characteristic equation. All these coefficients come from the matrix A. Okay, they're, they're just some strange combinations of the entries. It's a multi multinomial combination of the entries of the matrix A. And so all these are real value. Okay, so if there is a lambda naught for which this is true, Okay, if I just take the complex conjugate of this equation, then zero, the complex conjugate of zero is zero. So I have that a n lambda naught star to the n plus a n minus one lambda naught star to the n minus one plus etc plus a naught is also equal to zero. So basically, um, if lambda naught is a zero of the characteristic polynomial, then lambda naught star is also a zero of the uh, characteristic polynomial. So they always occur in complex conjugate pairs. Of course, if lambda naught is real valued, lambda naught star is a root of the characteristic polynomial, but it doesn't mean that it needs to be a, it has to be a repeated root. It could be a solitary root. Okay. 
Uh, but in that case, saying that if lambda naught is a root, lambda naught star is also a root is not saying anything else, anything new, because lambda naught and lambda naught star are actually the same number. Okay, so let's now discuss the next theorem. If A then there is a real orthogonal matrix Q in R to the N cross N, also real valued matrix such that Q transpose A U A Q is equal to a big matrix containing A one A two down to some A K along the diagonal zeros here and arbitrary things above the diagonal. is also real valued. Of course here all these are real valued so when I take their product it cannot suddenly become complex valued um, where each AI is a real one cross one matrix or a real two cross two matrix with a non real pair of eigenvalues. Okay, so the only difference that it makes is that you won't necessarily get an upper triangular form. You'll get a block upper triangular form where these blocks are either one cross one blocks or two cross two blocks. If they are one cross one blocks, they, they correspond to real valued eigenvalues of the matrix A. And if they are two cross two blocks, they correspond to non-real eigenvalues of A, which occur as complex conjugate pairs. Okay. I won't prove this theorem. The proof is actually similar to the previous theorem and you can see the text. But um, we'll discuss some consequences of um, the short triangularization theorem because we've said it's a very useful result. So let's discuss some, or some outcomes or some interesting things you can show by using this, uh, this theorem. Okay, first, um, Sir, before that, uh, yes, go ahead, please. Sir, in the theorem, we have told that uh, if A have uh, A and eigenvalues are real, then U is real and orthogonal, sir, orthonormal matrix, sir. That you. So. For example, my, we have as orthonormal only. Yeah. So my notation is that an ortho. Uh, so when I say orthonormal matrix, what I mean is I mean a matrix satisfying. U Hermitian U is the identity matrix. Okay. okay. When I say a real orthogonal matrix, I mean a matrix Q such that Q transpose Q is the identity matrix and the entries of Q are real. Okay. So there is a slight abuse of uh, nomenclature here, but when I say real and orthogonal, it actually means real and orthonormal. But I'm using orthonormal to generally represent complex valued matrices. So instead of saying complex orthonormal and real orthonormal, I'm saying orthonormal, which is for the complex case, 
and real orthogonal for the real real case. But really, the columns of this uh, real and orthogonal matrix are all unit norm, and the columns are all orthogonal to each other. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. So there is one interesting property I'll first discuss, and then we'll uh, show one cool result that you can show or establish by using the um, uh, using sure uh, triangularization theorem. By the way, have any of you seen this? So suppose A and B are n cross n upper triangular matrices. OK, such that. They have some special structure, both are upper triangular, but A. Is of the form. Zero. And then of course below this will be zero and then it has an upper triangular form here. And this can be arbitrary. Where this is a K cross K block of zeros. And B. Is of the form. <coughs> this K cross K block can be upper triangular and non zero. And of course below this is zero. And. Here below this you will have a zero and of course below this since it's upper triangular it has to always be zero and here it can be arbitrary but this part is again upper triangular and this is arbitrary again so basically this here is the k plus one comma k plus one element So this k plus one k plus one element is zero. Here there is a k cross k block of zeros. Then if I consider the product AB, anybody wants to guess what will be the structure in this matrix? When you multiply these together, basically when you multiply this with this, you will get zero. And here you're multiplying a, a column which has zeros down here with 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 this matrix. And so it will lead to a matrix which has a zero, which is of size K plus one. Cross K plus one. And of course, below that it's all zeros. And. Here it's arbitrary and here it is again upper triangular. So products of upper triangular matrices is upper triangular, but this is a special extra extra structure that I'm imposing as a consequence of which this matrix has a K plus one cross K plus one block of zeros. So you can verify this by direct multiplication by considering uh, entries with uh, you know BIG as the entries here and AIG of the entries here and see what happens. When you take them, take the product, but this is true. This property holds true. OK, so now we'll use this property in the result. Uh, 